uh, I am delighted at this time to turn the program over to our brother and outstanding scholar, uh, Dr. Kimani Nehusi. Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Santi. Um, Hotep to everybody. Let me begin by thanking Dr. Santi and the MKA Institute for providing this platform for continuous discussion. Um, it's extremely important that we as communities, and by this I mean a community of scholars as well as a community in its wider sense, get together and discuss our affairs on an organized and uh, continuing basis. And I believe that the provision of a platform for scholarship is an extremely healthy indicator of people who are moving in the correct direction. What I want to do this afternoon is what's outlined here, the Kemetic tradition as foundation for African unity. I think this is an extremely important um, uh, area that we must understand if we are really going to redeem ourselves from the depredations that other people have imposed upon us. And I don't want to detain us too much. I think most of us understand what Kemet is, in, at least in outline. So I just want to run through the significance of Kemet for us. And let me just say that it's the earliest version of ourselves that we possess in great details. I must stress here that Kemet, ancient Egypt, is not the beginnings of ourselves. African people began long before Kemet, but Kemet is perhaps the most well-known flowering of African civilization. You will be hard-pressed to surpass the achievements of Kemet, but it's not the only one. And it's not also our beginnings. It's a source of common origins. We could point to Kemet and see things that are common to all Africans, and I hope to illustrate some of these. It's a common blueprint of ourselves, our way of life, and our cultural institutions. In a word, our culture. We could look at Kemet and see where our culture comes from. And it's also an outstanding example. Like I said, the first civilization or high culture in the world. We could look at Kemet with pride. African people in Kemet led the entire world for over 3,000 years. No other civilization has come even close to such continuing dominance, if you want to use that word. And we could take just pride in knowing our ancestors achieved that. And to me, that's a platform and inspiration for all of us to plan and work and do to achieve. In this time when African people are oppressed by large conglomerations of others, it becomes very important for us to talk about African unity and the basis of African unity. Most times we talk about African unity, we do not talk about African culture. It's always like a political thing, which is a veneer at the top. If we understand our history and our culture, African identity, we're going to realize that each African person lives a version of a common identity that is rooted in a common culture and a common history or a history with vast commonalities that outweigh the discontinuities. And that's one of the reasons why the example of Kemet becomes so important. Here was the first confederation of states in the world. African people in Kemet 
organized 42 to 44 states, depending upon which era you're looking at. Sometimes it was 42, sometimes it was 44. We look at the United States of America today, and without thinking, sometimes we believe that this is something original in, in the sense that it's the first conglomeration of such. No, it isn't. African people have been there thousands of years ago. So this is a feat of organization as well as of administration. We could spend quite a long time talking about the administration of Kemet, how they use language, for example, iconography, um, symbolism. But what they achieved was unity and diversity. Every local area, a village, for example, or a region, or a state had its own identity while contributing to a common identity. At any level, in any area, you could think about whether it's language, whether it's the spiritual system, whatsoever. You could be yourself, whosoever you are, and still be part of a larger conglomeration of people. Of course, once you're not injuring your neighbors. So Kemet achieved unity in diversity. It was flexible to accommodate everybody, but at the same time, everybody contributed towards something that was greater than himself or herself at every level. And I don't think it would be opposite or even possible for us to talk about Kemet in this way without mentioning the great Shekhan Tujua, who warned us that ancient Egypt was an African civilization and that the history of Africa will remain suspended in air and cannot be written correctly until African historians dare to connect it with the history of Egypt, meaning Kemet. And this is a challenge, not only for historians in the narrow sense of historians, and I doubt where that um, Professor Giap meant only historians in that narrow sense. All scholarship, it doesn't matter what you're studying, African people must connect ourselves, our studies, our reflections upon ourselves to Kemet. And let me just say that African people have a far greater and solid foundation for connecting ourselves to Kemet than Europeans do in connecting themselves to Greece and Rome. It's fashionable almost thoughtless for us to begin with Greece and Rome because that has been imposed upon us. But if we stand outside of that and look at Europeans, we're gonna see that many of them do not have any strong claim to Greece and Rome, but we have outstanding claims to Kevin because we are continuations of our ancestors in the Nile Valley. Here is and he explains why we need to connect ourselves to Kemet, the ancient Nile Valley. He says that the bonds that we are in the process of reestablishing go back even before the birth of Egyptian civilization. And it is that historic bond that unites us and makes us and makes the difference. The fact that having lived in the same cradle shaped and transformed us, we are from the same place. And that has shaped us, it has transformed us from what we were before. He's talking about the birth of humanity here. He's saying that what happened at the birth of humanity transformed us and shaped us into human beings, African human beings. Other people would deviate, descend or whatnot from us later on, but we're the original. 
And this act shaped us. Instinctively, he says, we have the same sensory response to the same reality. For example, we have similar rhythm and a similar respect for nature. We have the same sense of unity and this potential for unity is a consequence of a shared history. In other words, because we had a shared history, we remember each other. It's easy for us to come together once we understand that. The same sensory response to reality, the same rhythm, we see this. You go all over the world and you strike up some music and you watch African people. We do the same steps. Nobody had to teach us that. Later on in this presentation, you're going to see something that will shock many of us, how we react and have been doing the same things for the, um, over a long period of time in response to the same stimuli. So what our ancestors talk about was a unity of the African world in a way that many other cultures do not understand and articulate unity. We're talking about a world community of African people. Africans past, all our ancestors, all Africans who were ever alive, Africans who are in this dimension, as well as Africans who are to come belong to this African world. And we must make certain that we work and plan and toil to bring this world back into a functional existence. Our ancestors knew that we come here from a world that I choose to call the spirit world. Many people call it the spirit world. We live. And when we do what we say, we die, we go back into the spirit world and wait to be recalled. These are transformational moments in our existence. Our ancestors in Kemet had a grand organizing idea called Ma'at. And I choose to write it out in the medal mention here because I want us to get over the psychological hurdle of reading and writing and interacting with the metal nature. Don't mind you can't read it, you may not understand the whole thing, it's ours. And we must become accustomed to it so that when we do, if we do decide to become proficient in it, we won't have that psychological barrier that I, for example, experience. And I know many other people experience. Ma'at could be expressed, it could be written out fully, or it could be expressed as a feather. All of these we could go into. And I have Dr. Sante, our chair, and his co-writer, Professor Abari, to thank for the demonstration that the key idea in the traditional African approach to life is Ma'at. We find it all over Africa. It may be stated and restated in different ways using different terminology. Sometimes people talk about truth. Sometimes people talk about justice. Sometimes people say, hey, you got to have order here. But they're always expressing a version of this larger idea or the larger idea itself, which is um, indicating the parameters of it are truth, justice, righteousness, order, balance, harmony, and reciprocity. But these by themselves do not define the concept. It's so big, it's so wide, it's so profound that these terms merely serve to indicate some of its boundaries. Ma'at, once we understand it, re, um, impacts upon everything we do, the self as individual, the self as various collectives, family, clan, community, and the social environment our spiritual environment, our physical environment, the entire universe. And Ma'at governs and shapes us and our interrelations with people and things, 
simultaneously. We are talking about a holistic existence here that our people have always known about and have always articulated. I do not, I do not exist as an individual. That's impossible in our people's understanding. I have become somebody only because I share relationships with other people. And if I belong to a family and a clan and a community, I don't stop belonging to any one of those things at any one point in time. I may be a father now, I'm doing my fatherly role or a fatherly role. That doesn't mean I cease being the son of my mother or a member of this particular clan or a community or a teacher or whatever. We are all of these things simultaneously. And I think it's important for us to begin to challenge ourselves if necessary to understand that about ourselves and stop thinking about ourselves as unidimensional beings in the way in which other cultures have sought to impose their understanding of reality upon us. Now, here is something else we have inherited from Kemet. And it's so wonderful and important for us to recognize this, as well as how other people have taken this inheritance from us and try to impose it upon us. Here, I want to focus upon the declarations of innocence. Our people believe that when somebody died, this was a point of transition. And that after the spirit underwent a certain voyage, journey if you wish, they come to the great hall of Mati, and then they had to recite the declarations of innocence for the four. Moses would praise them into the Ten Commandments later on, and they appeared two parts of the Bible. But those, that whole idea comes from here. And while your heart was being weighed, you could see the feather of Ma'at here. You had to um, recite these four to four declarations, four to two, sorry, declarations of innocence. This is a guide to good living. And if you knew you were telling a lie, your heart would become heavy. And you would be devoured by this fearsome beast. Your spirit would be devoured by this fearsome beast. Now, there's so much we could spend so long talking about in terms that we understand now, weighing the heart, which is the heart in ancient Egypt was the seat of conscience, morality. So we are saying, did you really live a good life? This is what it meant. We were challenged to live a good life so that when you come here, you'll have a pass. The whole notion of my heart becoming heavy, we repeat that today but we don't know that it comes from our ancestors. We need to reclaim this. We have Jehuti here, recording the proceedings. Jehuti is the first historian along with Shishat, a name that means literally the female scribe. They're recording what's happening. This, this is history being uh, made and written. Somebody tell us that um, somebody else was the father of history. Well, you have history here being written before the father of history. Here's another symbolism. The was scepter. We see this all over Africa today, and many of us don't recognize it. This is the symbol of pastoral responsibility. A fellow named Jesus would be given this symbol, the staff that he carries, comes from here, Heka. In ancient Egyptian, this 
sign means Hekan has many, many applications. The other stuff that he has here is a staff of temporal responsibility. I rule things in this geography. We see this all over Africa today. This is the famous fly risk that any potentate, we call them chiefs, would use. So again, here we have our ancestors in Kemet creating a tradition a foundation for us. This is a tradition of resurrection. It will be called later on, okay? Judgment of the dead. These are crude terms that we are familiar with. This is where we give an account for our deeds in our lifetime. What this does is challenge us to live a just, righteous, orderly ma'at life. Don't wait until you die. Live it now. This is what this is telling us. And it's aimed not at the dead, but at the living, again in crude terms. Our ancestors in Kemet also originated the construction of the self, the person and personality that many of us use today. I don't want to spend much time on this. Please ask me questions if you want to talk later on. But our ancestors knew very well that there was a physical body that we call the temple sometimes, and that this physical body contains other aspects of the self, the ka or a life force, energy. There's also the ba, or personality, which is an individualized idea of the ka. Then there was the an, the spirit, something that comes from our ancestors and contains racial memory, collective unconscious, all kinds of things, um, words we have for it today. The scientists call it DNA. And they know today that every cell keeps a record of its experiences and that we could articulate what happened to us, what happened to our ancestors and so on by looking at our DNA. This is no longer any mystery, but we need to understand that our ancestors knew this, they understood this thousands of years ago. We've met the heart already as the seat of morality, righteousness, reason, and that kind of thing. Our ancestors also knew that a name is extremely important. So the name was an aspect of the person. Shechem, which means the power or the potential of the person. They understood that each one of us have potential, but you have to train it. You have to achieve. You have to plan, organize, and work in order to achieve your full potential. And they also understood the shahu, or spiritual envelope. So we could have endless discussions on these. The important point to note is that our ancestors understood the multidimensional nature of the individual and how we are connected to each other and to our ancestors. Today, if you did psychology, you will see Sigmund Freud, sorry, Freud and uh, Jung featuring Freud the id, the ego, and the superego. In some places, we call it body and soul or mind, body, and soul. These are just variations and very often crude variations of what our ancestors knew and articulated very clearly. Oh, I forgot the shoot or the shadow, which is another aspect of the person. Now I want to run through um, the values that our ancestors understood. When you articulated, when you repeated the declarations of innocence, 
This is not something that was left for the end of your life. As I said, it challenged us to live that kind of life that would justify the easy, flawless recitation of those 42 laws. But we had social values that encouraged us in that direction. And we had individual expressions of those social values or ethics. These were traditions laid down. And if you looked at the autobiographical texts, even at the early stages of writing in Kemet, you're going to find that there was a concern for good living, just living, honest living, and so on. So you would hear or you would see somebody writing, I come from my village. They were very attached to the piece of ground they came from, and that's a whole different conversation itself. And they said things like, I was worthy of my mother, loved by my father. What they mean is that I was acting correctly towards my parents. They will say things like, I gave a boat to the boatless, food to the hungry, clothes to the naked. These things would become repeated later on in the Bible that Mark and um, Luke and expanded. But here is the beginning of this concern for your neighbor. And we know the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is the grandest statement of this. But it is rooted in our people's experience. We could go deeply into this. The Sibayat, or instructions, where public officials coming towards the end of their time in public office, or at the end of that office, would write a thesis distilling the lessons of their experience. And they would often address it as son, but this is a social son. It's not necessarily a biological son, but they want society to know, to benefit from their observations. So you would have the instructions or the sibayat of Ani, Tahotep, Meripuri, a whole lot of people. This is rich in ethical statements how you should conduct yourself as an individual, often in specific situations. We also have, on the grander side, narrative compositions that articulate these social values. And one of the most important is the story of the eloquent farmer. Europeans call it the story, the eloquent peasant. But that's a Eurocentric disdain for working people that is articulated there. The, in the eloquent farmer, this guy, the farmer who comes from what we might call the margins of Kemetic society in the sense that he lived in the countryside and that he was a farmer far away from the center of things. He's going on a journey and he meets with corrupt officials who do various things to him. But he is resolute. He says, speak my act, do my act. I must tell the truth always. And he's determined to be hard. And the Pharaoh hears him speaking so eloquently. The Pharaoh arranges for him to come back again and again and again because he is speaking truthfully, honestly, and eloquently. And this, uh, um, eloquence and truth are related in the ancient Egyptian conceptualization, conceptualization of these things. So this guy becomes a star. And the Pharaoh and everybody, they write down what he's saying. And there are all kinds of symbolism happening here in the number of times he appears and so on. But the essence of the story is that when you speak the truth, you will be vindicated. Let's look quickly at iconography. One of our sisters, Jennifer Williams, published something about this, um, the, the, the Trinity in ancient Egypt, the recent publications um, termed it. But here we have Isis, Osiris, and Wasir. 
um, and um, Heru, sorry. Um, the Greeks and Europeans give them their own names, and it's important for us to give them our traditional names. And this is a statement of the ideal family in Africa, but we must rush to understand that this is the beginning of an ideal family. This is what the Europeans would call the nuclear family. But a family in Africa and in African tradition could expand and contract. Cousin, somebody will come and live with us. Grandmother will live with us. If we're in a compound, we're gonna have other adults and other children. So although we put this forward as a statement of the ideal family, let us be clear as Obenga tells us that this family could change shape and form to suit circumstances. People arrive and people leave. So this is a starting point. Now, language. Language is extremely important. If you don't know a language, you don't know the culture concerned. Conversely, a language articulates a culture. And the language, if we're careful with it, would reveal itself to us as a witness and the record of a people's progress through space and time. A language is a witness and a record, a witness to and a record of a people's progress through space and time. We have time for one example. In ancient Egyptian, there is this word. And the Europeans translate it as, it comes from shoot, but they translate it to stare or stare at. And one person translated as to pierce with looks. To pierce with looks. What are we talking about? To pierce with looks? Well, you know it as slant eye. In some parts of the world, we call it cut eye. This is significant because ancient Egyptians were talking with all parts of their bodies, communicating with all parts of their bodies, just as we do today. Your mother and her friends are in the front room talking and you're doing some nonsense and she just casually looks at you in a certain way. And you know something is going to happen and you know when it is going to happen. She has communicated very clearly. Or you're going home and you're late and your grandmother is standing at the door and she has her hands at Kimbo, you know? You don't need to, to be told anything else. Communication. And this is one area, another one, in which it's important for us to understand that the cultural tradition we see in Quebec is what we still possess today. It won't always be identical to what transpired so many thousands of years ago, but here is one that's identical. And there are many more. And if you look carefully, you're gonna see that some of them have undergone certain changes, but we must reclaim these early examples of ourselves and our salvation lies in reattaching us, not only to our history as what happened when and blah, 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 but also to our cultural connections, our cultural history, our cultural belongingness, our cultural inheritance. It's only then that we're going to make sense or full sense of all that we do and how we do that. And this includes our interaction with the environment. Again, we could take a few weeks to talk about this. But here we have in ancient Egyptian a word, serucha, that means restoration, to maintain things in good order. 
or to restore things in good order. And we know, as Dr. Karenga explains to us, that this is operationally defined as planting trees, restoring trees, and so on. This is environmentalism. And we know from other sources that ancient Egyptians had an investment in maintaining things generally in good order. These are the words from which that word come in. This is the etymology of the word for environmentalism in ancient Egypt, Egyptian. Here's the word itself, okay? So we also had rituals. Ancient Egypt was a place of rituals. All Africa is a place of rituals. And when we look at rituals, we could see that the sum total of rituals was really to maintain Ma'at, to maintain the connections among people and beings in a very, very healthy way. And the work of rituals, the aim of rituals, was to maintain these connections. Then everything was okay, you still have to maintain that. When things are going a little bit wonky wonky, you need to strengthen them. And when there is a disconnection, you need to restore those links. Our ancestors told us this. And they did this through libation or drink offering, prayers, which is a word offering that came out of the libation statement. First fruit is the offering of the first and choicest part of anything you reap from Mother Earth. It's not only fruit, but it could be um, if you went and hunt. Sacrifice or blood offering and sensing or scent offering. All of these things our ancestors did in order to establish, re-establish, and maintain healthy connections with the environment in its widest understanding. So as we, at this point in time, face renewal, the challenge of renewal, we've been scattered and disconnected rendered ignorant, the most horrendous regression. We're challenged to become the best versions of ourselves. And we cannot become anything near to a good version of ourselves unless we know who we are. And we cannot know who we are by reckoning only from when some barbarians deposited our ancestors in America or Jamaica or Guyana or Cuba. Our history did not begin with our desecration by these barbarians. Our history began when history began because our people, our ancestors invented humanity and therefore invented society and history. And if we, if we are to approach the task of remaking ourselves in a way that is the most profitable, we will therefore need to reconnect with the earliest version of ourselves. It doesn't matter where we are in this world. All African people have this common investment in Kemet, in the Nile Valley, as a starting point of our civilization, of ourselves. And it doesn't matter where we are and however we articulate it. We are all talking about a new African world, a new Africa. But a new Africa is impossible without the new Africa. You cannot make this new Africa, the new African world, 
without the new African who will inhabit it and shape it and form it and take it forward. And this new African will not drop out of the sky or materialize from nowhere. We've got to discover what and who and how this new Africa will be. It is our task to make and shape this new Africa. And it is my submission to us that the rediscovery and reconnection so the earliest traditions of our people as articulated in Kemet is not only a source of that new African, but a source of our common unity. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kimani. Uh, 